Now we're joined by uh, John Smee, who's the uh, Vice President of Engineering at Qualcomm, talking a bit about uh, some of the 5G and new radio uh, advances going on. So, uh, John, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Very good. Well, I guess uh, let's talk initially um, what is different, or what is said to be different from uh, 5G and R, new radio, mm -hmm. than the current LTE, LTE air interface. Because I know there's been a lot of talk at the show here about, hey, what's going to be new about this? You know, what's the change that's going to happen between LTE and 5G? Sure. No, that's a great question. And of course, LTE itself was designed for in release 8 timeframe, and since then, it itself has evolved to take on new features and kind of move through release 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and now 14. And so the point of 5G, hey, what is different? And part of that is how can we design a overall air interface that's going to scale for another 10 years, even 15 years? Mm -hmm. And so then you're looking at uh, advances in silicon processing technology, just how many bands we can integrate into a device at Qualcomm, how fast we can turn around latencies in terms of you know, tighter uh, control loops between the network side and the device side for more mission critical type reliability. So if we look at the air interface, what's really different compared to say LTE is the fact that we're looking at things, if we look at the physical layer, mm -hmm. we're looking at how can we go to wider bandwidths? How can we go to lower latencies? Uh, how can we also serve a wider variety of use cases at the onset? So part of that means that we're designing a scalable air interface right off the bat. Another big one is we're address, addressing a wider variety of spectrum types. So it, it used to just be in the old days, you would talk about FDD, and then over time, more discussion on TDD. Here, we're talking about FDD, TDD, licensed, unlicensed, shared spectrum from the onset. So the techniques we're designing and discussing already in the release 14 study item are all about how can we work in a variety of spectrum paradigms, and also working in much higher spectrum bands. Millimeter wave bands are not part of LTE at all. So if we look at these bands above 24, such as 20A, you know, 37 to 39, 60 gigahertz, these different millimeter wave bands have unique propagation in terms of you know, what sort of materials they can go through uh, in terms of their uh, path loss and reflectivity. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of uh, interesting challenges to make those beam search and beam tracking in those bands. At the same time, there's still a lot of work to really push the boundaries of what we can do in the sub six gigahertz band. So that's where the traditional deployments already are today. Mm -hmm. And those bands, we, we talk of mid bands from one to six gigahertz, mm -hmm. and the low bands below one gigahertz, such as 600 megahertz, 700 megahertz. And so designing in those mid bands is an example of where we can really bring in things like massive MIMO, mm -hmm. bring it in more natively. And so these are some of the ways where the bag of tools or the bag of, of techniques has evolved, but so has the sophistication. If we look at our company and the size of our 5G team, it's very significant because we're addressing a lot of different technology aspects and bringing them together in this unified way. And then part of that is then, how do we approach, uh, approach the overall system design? And then how can we have benefits relative to LTE in each of these different scenarios? Interesting. Well, I guess as you look at kind of, you know, um, uh, the 5G in our design, I mean, what's, what do you see as maybe the most important uh, 5G technology innovation that's coming out of, sure. uh, or going into the work, I guess, at this point? Yeah, no, so I think that's a great question. And, and obviously, um, you know, we looked at historically, there would be this, oh, we're doing a new G because we have a new waveform that's, yeah. that's different or more optimized for a certain use case. Yeah. And so we had the CDMA, we had the OFDM. Um, and the reality is, if you look at 5G and you look at downlink and you look at uplink, uh, there is a big, big role for OFDM. And so I think for certain use cases, it's clear that you know, OFDM makes sense for, for mobile broadband and other waveforms uh, on the uplink, for example, you know, Qualcomm's proposal on resource spread, multiple access yeah. for the IOE, IOT type uplink has certain advantages because of the ability to have these grantless transmissions. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, look at the, the subframe design. Mm -hmm. So the aspect of what is transmitted when from the network and what is transmitted when from the device. Mm -hmm. And so one of the key innovations that um, that we've been working on is what we call the you know, self-contained integrated subframe. Mm -hmm. And what that means is the aspect of, of the base station transmitting a, a short you know, control channel at the very beginning of the subframe, and even within that same uh, subframe, having the device turn around a fast um, you know, ACK or SRS, basically a transmission from the device back to the network in that short turnaround time. Mm -hmm. So it's self-contained in the sense it's bookended by a downlink transmission and then an uplink transmission at the end. And in the middle, it could be downlink or uplink. Uh -huh. You know, we're talking for a TDD network sure. here, yeah. having a more dynamic TDD. So what is the opportunity to change 
and to further improve in 5G was this subframe design. So that was the first big thing that's different is, hey, we have a chance to make a new subframe. We have a chance to change the periodicity of transmission for have a more energy efficient network mm -hmm. and to have lower latency um, on the device by doing this fast turnaround. Mm -hmm. And then that also allows this dynamic TDD I mentioned mm -hmm. that enables a, a, um, you know, a network that can be more self-learning and self-adapting in yeah. terms of, you know, is it a heavy downlink scenario or a heavy uplink scenario? Uh, different traffic patterns evolve quickly in time as to um, you know, what, what direction the transmissions are going and how the network capacity is allocated. Whereas in the old days, you would have X amount of spectrum for downlink and, and this much for uplink if it was FDD, and you couldn't really you know, dynamically change. Yeah. So whereas the ability to quickly and smoothly change your TDD network. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is pushing data rates even higher means we have to really pay attention to energy efficiency right. at the device. Mm -hmm. So Qualcomm has been working on LDPC codes and how we can further uh, design advanced LDPC codes for very high throughput communications, multi gigabits per second, but with very good energy uh, efficiency at the device. Um, we're looking at new mobility procedures. So this is something that, that um, you know, makes it into the KPIs I mentioned earlier, where people would talk about what is the, um, you know, handover interruption performance, the latency on the control plane for communications. Mm -hmm. This is an aspect of, of as, a, as a device is moving through a, a dense network, mm -hmm. uh, how, is the, how are the handoffs being managed? What is seamless to the device versus to the network? So the ability of having a hybrid uplink and downlink based mobility. So today the device is making measurements, reporting those measurements in certain dense networks. It makes sense if the network is also making measurements to directly handle those handoffs. Mm -hmm. And so that's an example, even at the end of that subframe bookend I mentioned, mm -hmm. if the device is transmitting a periodic uplink signal every subframe, the network can use that information to handle very fast mobility management in a dense network. So if we look at the integrated subframe, we look at the, the design for things like massive MIMO and dynamic TDD, we look at you know, efficiency advances like LDPC, uh, we look at new uh, approaches for mobility. Those are some of the, the key areas we've been working on and contributing those to standards and in discussions with other companies. Yeah, interesting, just smarter and smarter networks really. I mean, the network is not just this dumb thing out there anymore that's reacting, it's trying to uh, pro be proactive more in what's happening out there. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, I mean, I also give the, the example of, uh, look at the context awareness of the applications you're using, yeah. uh, how that's evolved. And so then you think of the contextual awareness of the network. So the network being kind of a more adaptive breathing entity and the device working uh, in very close cooperation with the network yeah. to have these efficiencies and these new use cases. So that faster communication is something that also enables a dynamic uh, adaptability on both the device side and the network side. Yeah, interesting, really interesting. I guess, and maybe with a uh, final question, it's kind of, you know, what's, uh, I guess maybe talk a little bit about, I guess what Qualcomm is doing uh, to lead the way in 5G. And obviously you guys, you know, like I discussed earlier, you guys are doing, did quite a bit in 2G and 3G and 4G. Uh, what's kind of Qualcomm's uh, position in terms of kind of trying to help lead this industry sure. into the 5G world? No, no, that's a great question. And it's yeah. something that we've been working on for a long time. Yeah. And so there's the design aspect and then there's the advanced prototype aspect. So one of the things that kind of part of our history is we've always had it, you know, you got to build it first. Sure. So we have a, uh, in addition to uh, large system engineering teams uh, talking about advanced algorithms and, and looking at uh, detailed results of performance curves, we're also really pushing very hard on the, on the hardware, which is digital RF software. So bringing that all to bear in these advanced 5G prototypes. Mm -hmm. So even on the, on the research and development side, designing these advanced 5G prototypes in discussion with other vendors also, so we can move from uh, initial trials where we're testing out some particular technique in isolation mm -hmm. to then expanding that to a wider variety of techniques being supported and features, engaging with interop based demonstrations with, with operators worldwide and, and vendors, and then um, really showing the benefits of those uh, capabilities beyond the simulation results. So obviously in standards, we submit uh, detailed link simulation sure. results as well as network simulation results. And those network simulations themselves are something where we've been deriving uh, improvements even in the simulation infrastructure so that we can model a more complex series of these uh, deployment models, mm -hmm. these deployment scenarios. So we want to more accurately predict uh, what the network performance is going to be like in these complex scenarios, spectrum types, deployment models. Mm -hmm. So we look at uh, really pushing forward on the system design front, pushing forward on the prototype, 
pushing forward on the modeling front and in doing that as part of the ecosystem. So we've had a long history of working very closely with vendor partners and operators to really look at how can we work together to actually deliver then commercially at the end these very powerful 5G performances. Interesting, very good. Well, hey John, definitely appreciate the great insight today. Thanks so much for the time. You're welcome, thanks right. a lot. Very good.